Good morning, wonderful people. Welcome to my channel. Rahu and Ketu study part 20. But first, a personal note. Once again, <clears throat> I want to speak to you a little bit about senses. Among the five senses which we have, what is the largest sense that you possess? Think about it for a minute. Taste, smell, touch, sight, hearing. It's touch. It's all over your body, right from your feet, right to the top of your head. Touch is the most widely present sense in your body. And I want to speak to you about embrace. We embrace, we hug each other, yes? As lovers, as mother and child, as friends, as family, whenever we meet someone, greet someone, we give a hug. And so the touch becomes more important in an embrace. We are touching each other, right? Even with clothes on, clothes off is a different thing between lovers and so on, between mother and her baby, for example. That's more intimate. I'm talking about all kinds here, okay? The embrace. The embrace consists of the touch. It most dominantly you are touching the person. It's the most intimate form of contact. It's the most easily transmittable form of affection, of love, of understanding, of reassurance that we can give from one human to another. Yes? And why am I speaking about this? Because this next nakshatra where Rahu is falling is called Ashlesha nakshatra. Symbolizing the snakes. Symbolizing the Nagas, symbolizing the ground sensitive nakshatras, which I have spoken of in the earlier videos, the first awakeners in this shift. It is so dominant. If you have a dominant Ashlesha, number of points, planets present in Ashlesha, you will be the one of the first awakeners. Welcome to the shift. And this is much misinterpreted by most popular Vedic astrologers. Why? The Ashlesha is called as a cheat, one who will lie, one who will cheat to get through their way, etc, etc. Not so. These people are not understanding what Nagas are. Not what, they are not getting what snakes are. They are just not getting it. They are pretty stupid. One track mind of looking at things. That's why I keep telling you, knowledge depends upon who is touching it. What kind of mind is touching that knowledge? Is your mind pure? Or is your mind full of garbage and mind full of Rahu? Because then you'll try to twist it, interpret it according to your own little narrow thinking perspectives, which is very common in India, by the way, very, very common misinterpretations around. It's ironical that such great pure knowledge will come into the hands of idiots who doesn't know how to interpret it. So Nagas, back to Nagas. Why is this more important? Well, snakes know how to embrace, snakes know how to love one another in an embrace. Have you seen two snakes coiled up in a mating ritual? Have you seen the Discovery Channel? You see, it's like two spines. Snake's entire body is a spine and it is constantly in touch with the ground. It knows the ground energy and when it makes love to another snake, it is wrapped around it. So, Ashlesha people are very powerfully sensitive, powerfully vibrationally touch. Their entire body is very sensitive. This is why they react very quickly. Let's just see quickly what the Ashlesha themes are like. Protection and defense hurt easily, very sensitive inside, highly intuitive, clingy and the need to feel connected to the other, sharply analytical, intellect and emotion, quick reaction, snakes are very quick to react. Earth sensitivity, I spoke of the first of Eknar's ground sensitive nakshatra because snake is always in touch with the ground. It knows where the energy has moved. Snakes and Ashlesha people are aware of the shift happening on earth more powerfully than many others are. Shedding old skin and moving through life. They are introverted, they are quiet, they are irritable, they are vulnerable. But embrace is the main quality. If you lovers want to love each other, learn to embrace, learn to touch every part of your lover's body. Not just the face. People are so obsessed with one track mind. I looked at her, I looked at him. He is good looking. He's got muscles and few bits and pieces of the body. No. Learn from snakes. It's every single ounce of the skin that matters. Have you hugged every part? Have you touched every part? And you talk about lover and all this nonsense. Nothing. To learn from Ashlesha. But now we take put Rahu into Ashlesha. The unconventional one, the one who wants to explore. One of the qualities of Rahu is to explore, freely explore. 
एक्सप्लोर विदाउट कंस्ट्रेंट ऑफ द माइंड एक्सप्लोर वाइल्डली वाइल्ड इज द नेचर ऑफ राहो एंड सो इट बिकम्स ऑल अबाउट दिस वाइल्ड एक्सप्लोरेशन ऑफ द सेंस ऑफ टच ऑफ द सेंस ऑफ एम्ब्रेस अमंग अदर थिंग्स राहु हियर ऑल्सो कैन मेक दिस पर्सन हैव ऑल दीज इश्यूज विच आई जस्ट टोल्ड ऑफ अश्लेषा मोर एम्पलीफाइड इट डिपेंड्स अपॉन द वेदर डिस्पॉजिटर मून इज सिटिंग बिकॉज नाउ वी आर टॉक अबाउट कैंसर जोडियक साइन सो डिस्पॉजिटर बींग मून सो लेट्स गेट टू द स्टडीज एंड सी वॉट दिस लीड्स टू सो नंबर वन the classical characteristics of rahu and ketu as described by the classical vedic literature okay what is rahu and ketu these are the north and the south nodes of the moon found by the virtual points which are the intersection points between orbit of the moon around the earth and orbit of the earth around the sun so basically if you take two eclipses ellipses it will form two intersection points yeah so these two intersection points are called the north node and the south node they are virtual nodes although they behave like planets and we shall see why in a minute so who is rahu the symbols are there like a horseshoe and the reverse horseshoe right this is typically how it is portrayed in western astrology so i'm using the same symbol here rahu is mythologically depicted as the severed head of a demon symbolizing constant endless insatiable hunger and appetite be it sensual or physical yet it is unable to hold on to or grasp it or who is the one who constantly wants something think of it as a live head only not the body okay so it can't hold on to anything or be satisfied even if it gets that thing since it has no arms or body or stomach right? just a head which is alive this gives rahu the title of bhoga karaka or meaning one who is after sensory materialistic pursuits so think any earth sign for example they want sensory materialistic pursuits or think any of the signs literally whatever they are after rahu wants that and wants that very badly and goes after it with everything this is an energy in us by the way it is not a planet it's a virtual node but it will behave like a planet which we shall see why so it is unable to satisfy that hunger or hold on to anything even though it gets something it wants to move on to the next and then to the next and then to the next this is why varahu is also called as the guy who wants foreign things not of the native land or not of what the person is natively born in why because of that insatiable hunger there is always insatiable hunger to go after one thing after the another without being able to hold on to it that's rahu Ketu on the other hand is mythologically depicted as the severed body the remaining half of the demon symbolizing constant endless insatiable search for identity it is looking for the head but it doesn't have a head so it is looking for that identity everybody's identity ego is centered in the head what you look like right it is also seeking for true purpose sense of self as a result of this it tries to hold and grab on to everything that it can find its hands on because it has got hands ketu has got hands it's trying to hold on to everything but it releases immediately because it knows that's not the head it's like trying to grasp on to everything thinking oh i want this or i am this i am that i am this not getting any identity because it's not finding the head there since it has arms and walks everywhere it goes around through life walking from place to place people situation circumstances but not knowing who or what it is it doesn't have a head this is why ketu is referred to as moksha karaka or the seeker's path the one energy in us which seeks something that's why ketu is called the moksha karaka now this is the classical interpretation okay now we shall see how this plays out in the modern interpretation very important to connect the bridges now here you have the rahu ketu general characteristics as modern interpretation this i have borrowed from the book on light on life by robert so was an excellent book i have put it in the community tab if you want to go through it or purchase it and read it i seriously suggest that okay the north node of the moon rahu what does it become because of the characteristics which classically is told in the texts what does rahu lead to in the modern context rahu is responsible for originality individuality independence insight ingenuity inspiration and imagination on the positive side 
Because Rahu and Ketu both love to explore foreign stuff, things out of the box, things not taught by tradition, Rahu and Ketu will be anything but traditional. Okay? Think of it as something foreign to the culture, to the way you are taught things. Looking for original stuff. If there is one singular force that is responsible for creating everything that we keep modernizing, so to speak, thinking out of the box, it is this. That's why it's important to pay attention to this. Okay, back to this. So Rahu on the downside becomes leads to confusion, escapism, neurosis, psychosis, deception, addiction, vagueness, illusion and delusion. This is the downside. Now how this plays out and why we'll have to see individually in the charts. We shall, we shall see that. Okay. Ketu. Ketu, the guy with only the body, no head there, is gives us the feeling of universality, impressionability, idealism, intuition, compassion, spirituality, self-sacrifice, subtleness on the positive side. On the downside, it can lead to eccentricity, fanaticism, explosiveness, violence, unconventionality, amorality, iconoclasm, impulsiveness and emotional tensions. This is on the downside. This is what it plays out and Rahu Ketu is typically an axis like it is shown over there, right? Rahu Ketu, let me remove myself for the time being from that axis, okay? There you are. So you see it as an axis, okay? 180 degrees apart and it can play out in any one of the opposite houses. It can play out in 1, 7, 2, 8, 3, 9, 4, 10, etc, etc. We will see that later. But this axis becomes a definition point of where in your life, in your different houses, are you looking for these two aspects and they are always opposite to each other as you can see. Okay, to stand opposite to each other. So if it plays out in second house, it detaches itself from the eighth house. If Rahu is in second house, it, Ketu will be in the eighth house. You see what I mean? And so you will bring the eighth house aspect with these aspects shown here, second house with that aspect shown over there. Of course, it plays out with something called as dispositors. We shall see that next. Now, if you go to a traditional Vedic astrology, they will go on and on endlessly about dispositors. What the hell is a dispositor? It's an invented term by the Vedic astrologers. It has no meaning of its own. It shows the disposition. And what's the story on this? Rahu and Ketu both are enemies of the sun and the moon. This is the basic principle. So it has the solar aspect and the lunar aspect. The solar aspect is called the dispositor and the lunar aspect is the nakshatra which gives the entire characteristics and the ball game of Rahu and Ketu. Okay? The solar or the dispositor means since Rahu and Ketu are enemies with the sun and do not have a full identity of their own. Remember it's a virtual node. It is not a planet. They both do not have any planetary characteristic individually. So they take on the identity or the disposition of the lord of the zodiac sign that they sit in and borrow the attributes of the house from which that lord sits in. Suppose Mercury is in the third house. Okay. And Rahu sits in the house of Mercury somewhere else. So it will borrow the attributes of Mercury sitting in that third house and bring it to that particular house wherever Rahu is sitting in. Got it? Nakshatras. Since Rahu and Ketu are enemies with the moon and do not have a full identity of their own, individually they take on the shade of personality. Nakshatra is essentially a shade of personality. It's coloring of a personality. It's seeing the world through different colored glasses. That they sit in and borrow the nakshatra traits and attributes which color their propensities. So Rahu and Ketu do two things at the same time. At the solar level, it goes with the dispositor, that is all of the planets, physical planets, Mercury, Mars, Venus, Sun, Moon, so on. So they take on the attributes of whichever house they are sitting. If it sits in Rahu sits in Cancer, it will you have to look for where Moon is sitting, which house, and what it is doing there, and even the Moon Nakshatra. If it is sitting in Leo, Rahu in Leo, that means it will you have to look for where Sun is sitting and which Nakshatra and which house. So it will bring those attributes. That's the way you have to analyze this. Okay. Let's see some aspects of which house they play in and why. 
Now, there are some vital aspects that you keep, need to keep in mind when evaluating Rahu and Ketu because this is important for, especially for people who are sort of looking for self-development to understand where they are coming from. If you are not interested in changing yourself, this entire channel is useless for you. But if the other one who is interested in knowing what is happening in my life, where do I need to go, what are my talents and you question these kinds of things, excuse the noise somebody is drilling about. So, then you need to understand these aspects. Now that's the typical chart, Indian chart. And house numbers are depicted as 1, 2, 3, 4, up till 12. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha is there. And I have stuck Rahu Ketu as possible axis on the 1, 7. That is Aries and Libra, that is the top and the bottom. So either it can go to house number 1 or 7. Rahu Ketu can be reversed, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Or in 4 and 10. Now 1, 4, 7 and 10 in Vedic Astrology are given very vital importance because they are the foundational aspects that define who you are, that define how you operate in life, throughout life. So these become crucial. Why? The 1, 7 axis effects, if Rahu and Ketu fall on there, has a direct effect on your self and other concept. 1 and 7 is self and other. How you re relate to yourself and how you relate, look at the world around you as others including the spouse because seventh house is the house of the spouse but also others so how you develop through life and how you develop a relationship with others so it defines who you are in a very broad sense one seven axis of rahu ketu the four ten on the other hand fourth house being the house of the mother tenth being father fourth being home tenth being career you see this has a you know all kinds of implications which define who you are the 410 axis has effects on the heart versus mind. Mind wants to, is the one who goes out there in the world and being used in the career, right? You dissipate your energy as the mind in the external world. Heart is your home, your home center where you feel comfortable. Home is where the heart is, that kind of a thing. So heart and home is affected by this Rahu Ketu axis. Again, Rahu and Ketu might be reversed. Rahu might be in the 4th, Ketu might be in the 10th or vice versa. Same way with 1 and 7. But these are the vital relating aspects of Rahu and Ketu. Now what about the rest of the houses? Now rest of the houses are called Trikona or Kona in Sanskrit, right? These are the things that come and go in your life. Let it be 2nd house, 3rd house, 5th house, 6th, 8th. 9th, 11th, 12th, these are the things that come and go in our life, through life, through your entire life. These are things that are added into, subtracted from us. But this is not us. 1, 4, 7 and 10 is us. Everything else is secondary which revolves around you as life comes and goes. All other axes depict what attachments and detachments we have towards different areas of our life. That's all it is. They are less significant in terms of Rahu and Ketu when compared to 1, 7, 4 and 10 axis of Rahu and Ketu. Please remember this. When you are evaluating, you just have more propensity towards one part of life and less towards others. Rahu is attachment, Ketu is detachment. Rahu is expansion, Ketu is reduction. And they stand opposite to each other always. Right? Now let's take the cases one by one. So there, now we get into Rahu in the first Pada of Ashlesha, ruled by Nagas, the serpent energy, the Kundalini energy, basically. Right? And we are talking basically about Cancer and going into Capricorn. So Cancer Capricorn axis. Right away you should be able to tell dispositors, right? Cancer Moon, Capricorn, Saturn. So the different types of energies faced between Saturn and Moon. Rahu is in the moon nakshatra. Remember, Rahu is enemies with the moon also. So if it gets, it gets into the moon kind of energy, it can become a little divergent kind of approach. Okay, So that's what you got to be careful of. Rahu has a power, but it needs to be brought back to the center. And where can it get this energy from? From Ketu, which is now going between Dhanishtha and Shravana nakshatra. Saturn, one who is grounded. So now let's see the axis. We are talking in the fourth Pada, Rahu is in the fourth pada over there, as I'm showing. And then between Ashlesha and Dhanishta, between Cancer and Capricorn. So, what does this play out like? Cancer going into Pisces, meaning Moon going into Jupiter as the dispositor for Rahu. And on the other side, Ketu going from Capricorn to Virgo. Saturn going into Mercury. 
it's a very different kind of energy which goes from pisces to virgo means pisces to virgo yeah it's that push and pull between emotion and materialism so these people in the beginning part of their life they might be all about emotion and getting wisdom searching for knowledge searching for the deeper meaning and knowledge and they need that at the later stages of life they will go into becoming earthly and grounded virgo whereas ketu is not doesn't do very well in virgo see that's the thing ketu is not wanting grounding ketu is wanting moksha it's wanting liberation okay so in virgo it does not do well same thing with rahu in pisces jupiter jupiter provides the higher wisdom but this rahu because of the little rascal that he is he wants to do everything in an unconventional manner you can't try to take wisdom and put unconventionality into it wisdom is wisdom it's universal right this is where it becomes a little odd now let's see the next pada also in the previous slide i forgot to mention watch the dhanishta nakshatra also dhanishta has the belt has the talent has the talent for music dance drama that it can bring and assist the ashlesha over here now we come to the third pada in third pada it goes into the dharma kama axis meaning the uh, rulers become aquarius and leo in namamsha meaning it will become saturn and sun the father and son dynamic the wanting fame for self versus wanting fame for by doing things for others saturn aquarius 11th house so what is it doing this house <clears throat> first of all let's see the themes of ashlesha once again ashlesha is about embrace it's about learning the knowledge of things of earth it has the knowledge of poisons remember snakes venom poisonous so ashlesha people if there are dominant good planets they can become good have good knowledge of poisons they can become homeopathy doctors they can become unconventional healers not mainstream because they have knowledge of herbs poisons knowledge of the earth and being ruled by nagas it has knowledge of the poisons how poisons can be made into cure like homeopathy majority of homeopathy medicines are poisons do you know that anyway back to and on the other side it's dhanishta which is all about talent wealth etc and then it's going into sun in leo ketu ketu and sun combination so what it will want to bring is knowledge of talents from the past life in order to fulfill what it wants to bring to the masses now cancer going into aquarius think about that let's do pada 3 or pada 2 Now, in Pada Two, Artha Pada of Ashlesha, we change the the nakshatra. In Capricorn, we go to Shravana nakshatra. Shravana is all about Jupiter, but it goes here in this case from Capricorn to Cancer, and Cancer to Capricorn. So you are talking like once again about the reversal, a flip of personality. After thirty six years of age, these people can change a lot if Rahu Ketu is in this axis, in this angle, because the angles are mentioned. Take care of to note all these padas. Okay, padas is everything in Vedic astrology. Everything, the angle at which it is placed is so small. It is less three degrees twenty minutes per pada. It is very narrow segment we are talking about. So Capricorn to Cancer, Ketu goes more like towards the Moon in uh, after thirty six years of age, whereas Rahu goes more towards Capricorn. and being practical so rahu does very well later on in life because capricorn is very grounded right <clears throat> it wants to do material stuff rahu it's a bhoga karaka so this becomes a good axis a better axis compared to others now let's see the first pada see the first pada is all about Gemini Sagittarius, right? Gemini Sagittarius is once again the Guru Shishya, once again the teacher, the student dynamic in the Navamsha. Natal remains the same. That's why I don't cover too much of Natal. It's Cancer versus Capricorn, Moon versus Saturn. But now we're talking about Jupiter versus Mercury. So what does it do here? What does Sagittarius want to do in Ashlesha? It wants to become the Guru. It wants to learn knowledge. These are the ones I was talking about becoming the healers. Cancer going into Sagittarius is a powerful healer. they might want to study about herbs herbology homeopathy uh, ayurveda all of these kinds of things it's very good because ashlesha knows the knowledge 
and from the past life it brings in the gemini energy the intellectually learned knowledge from past life in order to bring it as knowledge to this life around that's what it means okay next we shall be doing pushya nakshatra another the second dominant nakshatra of cancer and then we'll be going from half of shravana over there into uttara ashada meanwhile take care be safe and sing and dance it's a changing world it's a changing planet